good morning. Are you supposed to do jujitsu? Okay, fine. She was staring at me. It comes to mind that I, that's probably because I'm standing on the stage. <laughs> okay, well, um, Pastor and Sister Pastor in Texas, they'll be back on uh, Tuesday. So um, just in case you didn't hear, um, Women's Bible Study will be canceled on Tuesday. Um, okay, so we'll go ahead and start. Um, well, if you have been coming on Wednesday nights, uh, Pastor's been talking a lot about false prophets and that kind of stuff. He's, he's been talking about that general idea for about a year and a half, I would guess, or maybe two years. Now, I'm not saying that he says the same thing every week. I'm not saying that. But just kind of following a theme for the past two years. And I kind of wanted to um, to kind of build on what he's been teaching on. Um, did you know that um, sometimes we'll believe something is true that's actually false? And I've talked about this before, being deceived. But there are some times that somebody will say something to, or something, and it'll just sound so good. So it'll be like, I accept that. Why? Because it's the attitude that it was set in, and it was encouraging. So even though it wasn't necessarily true, we hold on to it because it just sounded good. You know, and um, so we're going to look at two specifically false things um, today. And uh, the first one is words, false words, false things that people <coughs> say. And the same thing is false people or false Christians. Now, I, 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 I have always heard pastors talk about this kind of stuff in a very judgmental, um, kind of closed-minded way. And I'm trying not to do that. So I don't want you to go into this thinking that I'm just going to stand up here and start yelling at people. That's not my intention at all. The thing is, we like the idea of hearing God's word. We like, like, we like the idea of hearing from God, you know, and that kind of stuff. But if we actually stop and, and wonder if we genuinely want to hear God's word, a lot of the times it'll be no. Because God's words hurt sometimes. God's, God will tell us things that we are doing that he doesn't want us to do. And that kind of hurts us. That kind of hurts our pride. Because we don't want somebody to tell us that we're wrong. We want somebody to constantly validate us for who we are so we can go on living our lives just the same. And God doesn't do that. God wants us to grow. He wants us to learn and adapt. He wants us to be better off in the outcome. But we only see in what's immediately in front of us. So if it doesn't immediately profit me, see what I mean? We just kind of that's not from God because it's not instantly gratifying. But if you look at historically throughout the Bible, the things that God does oftentimes doesn't have an immediate payoff. And the things that Satan does oftentimes does have an immediate payoff. I mean, you go all the way back to the very first story in the Bible. Here's Adam and Eve in the, in the garden, and Satan's like, hey, forget about this whole lie going the rest of your existence not eating from the tree, that sounds like it's you're not going to see a payoff. How about we eat the fruit now and you'll see a payoff. You'll be like God now. So I mean, that, that instant gratification. And it's kind of the exact same thing that's been going on throughout history. That, that idea of I can grab whatever I want and I just have to hold tight enough so nobody else gets it. And then Jesus comes along and he says something completely different you got to let it go. you got to die to live. It's like, well, hold on, Jesus. That's the exact opposite of what we've been trying so hard to do. You know, and uh, so that's kind of the idea of what, I'm, what we're talking about tonight. So first off, words. When somebody says something or maybe like a, a word, like in, uh, the gift of, of you know, prophecy or, or uh, words of encouragement, that kind of stuff, whatever it is, things that people say. Some things are not true, but they genuinely make us feel good and they genuinely move us. I knew that I know that was God because I cried when they said it. It could just be that you're discouraged and the thing was so encouraging and you've been so encouraged to pride for so long that you held on to it when it actually wasn't true. See, in our culture, how you feel about something is exalted beyond what is actually fact or not. And it's not just not religious or just religious people, it's it's kind of everybody. It's kind of in our culture. You see scientists who, who believe in evolution. I'm not saying anything about evolution. That's not my point today. But then they say, well, 
we don't believe that there can be a God because we can't put him in a test chamber. And since science gives us all knowledge that we can possibly know, which it doesn't, therefore God isn't real because I don't want him to be real. So I mean, it's a circular argument that just goes around and around and around. Now, why did they come to that conclusion? Because they don't want God to be real. Because if God is real, that has serious implications for how I'm supposed to live my life. See what I mean? There, there's a lot of things that people just don't want to be true, and so they'll find anything to hold on to to make it not true. Okay, so um, one thing is, uh, a word is not true if it condones immorality, if it condones living, setting your own standards with what is right and wrong. Ezekiel chapter um, 13, chapter 13, verse 20 and 22 says this, Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I am against your magic bands by which you, uh, you hunt lives there as birds, and I will tear them from your arms, and I will let them go, even those whom you hunt as birds. Found down in verse 22. Because you disheartened the righteous with falsehood when I did not cause him grief, but have encouraged the wicked not to turn from his wicked way and preserve his life, therefore your women... You women will no longer see false visions or practice divination. And I will deliver my people out of your hand, so that you will know that I am the Lord. So here we have people, false prophets, saying the wrong things and condoning living in a way that is contrary to how God wants us to live. Condoning immorality. Condoning living your own way. Condoning not following God's standard of life. Now, we have to expect for people in the world to condone immorality because they don't serve God. And you know it's important that we don't have a shouting match to them trying to tell them, hey, you need to live according to God's standard. But they don't serve God, why would they do that? See what I mean? Um, but the problem is when we as Christians condone immorality in somebody else's, else's life, in the church, or out of the church, it doesn't really matter. See, it's okay for you to do that wrong thing, fill in the blank, because it was just so hard for you. See what I mean? It's okay that you cheated on, on your husband because he was never really there for you. See what I mean? Condoning immorality. Another thing is contradicting previous words. When something is supposedly said, or actually said, but which is supposedly from God, or from a Christian either or, um, and it contradicts what God has previously said, it is not true. And in Ezekiel chapter 13, verse 10, for instance, it is definitely because they have misled my people by saying peace when there is no peace. And when anyone builds a wall, behold, they plaster over with whitewash. So here we have Ezekiel coming after Jeremiah. And Jeremiah has already told these people, Jerusalem is going to fall. You're going to be conquered by Babylon. And there's these other people coming. That's not going to happen. Don't worry about it. It's going to be fine. Peace. It's all going to be fine. Well, then here, here comes Ezekiel. And he's saying, didn't you hear what Jeremiah said already? There, you, you guys are saying peace, but there is no peace. This is going to end in... Jerusalem's destruction. And so condoning immorality or con uh, if it contradicts previous words. And the thing is, you kind of have to be on your guard at all times. You know what I mean? Because something that Jack Sparrow says on Pirates of the Caribbean really speaks to me on a personal level. He says, you can always trust dishonest people to be dishonest. Honestly, it's the honest ones you have to watch out for. Because you never know when they're going to do something dishonest. That's absolutely true. You never know. You never know when somebody who you once trusted, like think about all those um, televangelists that have been caught with their hand in the cookie jar, so to speak. Does that mean everything they ever did was wrong? No. It means that they fell. See the difference? So you have to literally weigh everything that is said because you never know if it's true or not unless you base it on what God has revealed is true. Well, the world says, life is short, so you might as well grab as much of it as you can. But is that true? Well, no. God says you have to die to self. So that means I can't live in the, in the passions of the flesh. Does doing drugs feel good? Well, from everyone I've heard do it, they always say yes at the time, but afterwards it doesn't. I've never done drugs, so I really can't comment. Uh, you know, drinking, a lot of people have a good time with social drinking, for instance. Um, you know, sleeping around, I bet that, once again, I, I've never done this either, you know. 
But I hear that people say that, you know, they enjoy it at the time. It's, it gives them a rush or whatever. You see what I mean? Like, different things like that. I hope you kind of get what I'm saying here. So uh, just another kind of area here. Um, if it's not true, if somebody says something, it's just plain not true. Like, for instance, if somebody says that God told them to tell you. I can't think of anything other than on the top of my head. Um, okay. That God told you to get a divorce. God doesn't tell people to get divorces. So you know that that word is not from God. If you decide to get divorced, that's your decision. But don't blame that on God. God says that he hates divorce. He wants us to succeed. He wants us to not grow bitter. He wants us to forgive. These are the things that God wants for us. Now, once again, if you decide to get divorced, that's your own decision. But don't blame that on God. I mean, that's, that's kind of what I'm talking about here. Things that just plain aren't true. If somebody says something that doesn't happen, next year you're going to get a job. And here we are next year, the year after that year, in fact, and you still don't have a job. Well, then that was a false word. God's words are never not true. God's words have a 100% accuracy rate. That means there's never a time when they don't happen. You can go through the prophet, to the prophets and see that for yourself, but I'm not going to waste your time with that. Um, also, one last thing that's worth mentioning on this one is if it doesn't preserve the uniqueness of God. Go, how do I have it on the slide there? Um, go to the next point there, Benny. Uh, if it blurs God's character. For instance, um, nowadays it's, it's kind of um, a point of, I guess you could say, contention where, where people are trying to make God less offensive. And so they're equating him with other people. For instance, our God is the same God as the God of Islam, for instance, or is the same God as one of the Hindu gods, or something like that, to try and make, um, to kind of bridge the gap. Does that kind of make sense? To make it less offensive so that you can follow your own path, do whatever you want, you know? And that blurs God's character because the whole point of the Old Testament is to show how much God is not like those other gods. I challenge you to go read ancient texts from the ancient Near East. And then compare those gods to our God, and you will see that it's just a world of difference. Some people have said, oh, well, the Old Testament is basically just an adaptation of those ancient literature. Well, that's like comparing a dog to a human, as Oswald once wrote. See, on the skin, yeah, they are kind of similar. They've both got two eyes, you know, they both walk around, they've got two ears. But if you actually look at them for what they are, they're, they're fundamentally different. The dog is completely different from a human in essence. See what I mean? And, and that's kind of the same thing that goes there. I, I could talk all day for that, but if you want to know more about that, there's a book by John Oswald called um, The Bible Among Myths, and I think that addresses it fairly enough. Um, so if it blurs God's character, if it is something that clearly... Like, for instance, here's another example. In our culture, it's all about your power, the power of you, right? Finding yourself, it's all about you. So then if God gives you a word, or supposedly God gives you a word, that downplays our dependence on God and makes the main focus you finding your power within yourself, we know that that's not from God because that blurs God's character. God's, God's word never says, hey, be dependent on yourself. Solve your own problems. You don't need me. It says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. That's what God's word says. There's a difference there. Now, obviously, God gives leeway to make life decisions, like should I have take this job or this job? But there's sometimes when we try and make God's decision our own. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 20 through 22 says this, um, but the prophet who speaks a word presumptuously in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or which he speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. So two different things. One who supposes it to be from God, or one who says that it's from a different God. Okay? You may say in your heart, how will we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? It just makes me laugh. He says, how will we know the word that God hasn't spoken instead of the word, how will we know which word God has spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not... Do you know why he said that? Because God already spoke in the law. So you can know what God hasn't said. See what I mean? That's his point. You aren't getting new revelations out in the desert. This was your revelation. 
that's it. You stop finding new revelations. And what have been, people have been doing ever since? You know, in Galatians, Paul says, you know, if somebody else even claims even to have something from an angel, let them be cursed. And so then you have the Jehovah's Witness, who supposedly got this special revelation. The Mormons, who supposedly got this special revelation. Muhammad, the prophet of, of Islam, he got his revelation from what? An angel, supposedly. All these people claim to have all these special revelations. And Paul already wrote 2,000 years ago, if anybody claims to have such a revelation, there would be a curse. So we're talking about false words here. When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if a thing does not come about or come true, that is a thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously, you shall not be afraid of him. And I think in verse 13, he also talks about how you have to watch out with people saying words um, because sometimes it'll be true, but then he'll say, Let, let's go worship other gods. So it has to be congruent, um, has to connect with, with what God has previously said. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, now, Paul wrote first in 2 Corinthians to obviously the, the Christian church that existed in a, in a little city called Corinth. And uh, the people there, they treasured format over content, much like America. If it sounded good, it was better than if it was good. And they would judge something based off, solely off of the presentation. If the person was a good speaker, for instance, they had a good rhetorical argument or rhetoric-based argument. Whereas Paul wasn't so great at talking. So they said, well, he's kind of weak with his words. Well, what he said was true, though. And in fact, Paul, Paul reprimands him on one part. He says, I, I am writing you this letter. I am who am so weak when I'm with you, but so strong in my letters. In other words, my letters sound real good. I just can't, can't talk as good as I write. <laughs> St. Corinthians chapter 11, verses 4 through 6, he actually kind of talks about this. For if one comes and preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you bear this beautifully. And then on through uh, 6. For I consider myself not the least inferior to the most eminent apostles, but even if I am unskilled in speech, yet I am not so in knowledge. In fact, in every way we have made this evident to you in all things. So you have to watch out for things that sound real good. Weigh words that are said. Excuse me. Um, I had hot tea and I had a little bit too late today, I think. Um, so then the second thing uh, that you have to really be discerning about is people. Um, false people, false Christians. Now, we expect people in the world to lie to us, right? Because, you know, whatever. But it's when people in the church lie to us, I think that it really does us the most damage. Because we were supposed to be one body. We were supposed to have common goals. And they talked about me? What? Sadly, it's a very common story that, you know, someone in the church gossiped about someone else. You know, we, we, have, to be, we have to watch out for what, our, what we say with our words. They can really be hurtful to people. Um, we're supposed to be building up the body, not tearing it down. So anyways, th this, is, this is a newsflash for some people, but did you know that people lie? I know, right? If you just say it like that, it sounds like, yeah, I, I know that. But then somebody will tell us something, they did that to you? Yeah, and I didn't even do anything. They just did it to me. No way. You know, we believe them readily enough. We don't weigh what they said. So then we get caught up in these gossip circles. They did this to me. They're a dirty rat scandal. You know, well then, then you go on this quest of hating this person until finally they tell you their side and then you get caught even more on the gossip because this is how you should have responded in the first place. I don't want anything to do with talking, about, talking bad about this person. I don't want nothing to do with that. You have a bad attitude, you need to correct your bad attitude even if they were wrong. Because that is the way of Jesus. What did Jesus say right before he died? Father, forgive them that they don't know what they're doing. Versus what we say, God, strike them dead because of what they did to me. Do you see the difference there? The difference. Forgive those who persecute you. Pray for them. Big difference. That goes against everything that comes naturally to us. So anyways, um, they will make themselves the victims. You know, I have been wronged. I'm so, I'm so despised by everyone. <laughs> Don't get caught up and listen to this nonsense. I mean, goodness sakes, if, if, if we aren't working towards a common goal of God's kingdom, 
you're wasting your time. You know, and so what we do is we get up in these gossip circles, and it's like we're, we're God's appointed gossip listener. You just tell me whatever's on your heart, honey. I'll, you know, I, I'm here for you. Well, that's great that you're there for someone. Absolutely be there for something. Don't get caught up into gossip. There's no one on this earth that you need to talk bad about. That goes for the president. That goes for who could have been the president. That goes for who was the president. That goes for a pastor who was the pastor, who will one day be the pastor. You don't need to gossip about people. That's nonsense. That, that our mouth should not be filled with bad and good. It should be a pure spring. Absolutely. So, okay. Um, and then they will call themselves Christians. Now, obviously, I'm not talking about the people in the world. I'm talking specifically about false Christians. Because I run into a lot of people who want to call themselves Christians, but they don't actually want to do what God has told them to do. So the first thing that watch out for is if they don't obey God. Some people are convinced that they are Christians, but they don't follow God. And the thing is, how do you help them to get over their immoral lifestyle if they believe that they're fully justified in their immoral lifestyle. See? So then you say, well, why argue with them that they're not really Christian? Well, I, I totally agree. Don't argue, don't argue with people trying to convince them that they're not. I totally agree with that. However, there does need to be some kind of dialogue that you're helping them without being judgmental or combative or anything like that to grow. Because the Bible makes it clear that when we don't live God's ways, we are not his children. For instance, I, I know some people, for instance, that were, and I'm not going to turn this into a gossip thing because this is something that's very common, um, that have bad feelings towards their mom and dad. They think they're the worst people in the world. And then they call themselves a Christian, and they've been saved for longer than 10 years. It's like, well... Not that there's a cutoff time, but God said that if you don't forgive others, neither will I forgive you. Also, never once in the entire Bible did it say that your parents are going to be subjected to you. Never once. It said, children obey your parents, for this is the first command with a promise. Totally different than what we hear. But what we hear is, your parents wronged you, they're low down, dirty, rotten scandals. And that's not the way, that's not the way that God works. Um, so First John, um, verse 6, If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. You see what he just said? If we say that we have fellowship, if we say that we're a Christian, and yet walk in darkness, and, and yet not obey him, do whatever we want, we lie and do not practice the truth. So God said that we're not a Christian if we do that. Now, I don't want you thinking, well, he's telling us how to judge people. Well, wait for the grand finale before you judge this message. John chapter 14, verse 23 says, um, Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. If anybody loves, they will obey. Connecting the two. Okay, so, another sign tells you to follow your own path, to find your own way. Go to the next slide, everybody, or the next point there. Find what works for you. I can always tell the people who backslide because they'll be sure of God's ways before they backslide. And then afterwards they'll say, it's kind of a gray area. Well, I just had to find what worked for me. They're no longer concerned with what does God say. They're concerned with this is how I've rationalized my life. There's a complete switch between dependence on God versus dependence on self. So you really have to watch out for this. Deuteronomy chapter um, 13 Verse 1 through 4, if a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder comes true concerning which he spoke to you, saying, let us go after other gods whom you have not known, and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to find out if you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. See, God will allow these things to come by um, to kind of test us and grow us in character. So another thing. They excuse their actions, they live for themselves, they are showy oftentimes, they're oftentimes in it for the money. And in fact, that's one of the things that Paul mentions. These people were coming and claiming to be super apostles. They were, you know, they were they were really they really had, had it all together. And then they were charging. They were expecting a pay. Now, I'm not talking about like providing for ministers. Absolutely, absolutely, you know. 
Um, the Bible has plenty to say about that. About you know, I, but I'm talking about people who go and say, "I have the word of the Lord. You pay me, and I'll give it to you." See the difference there? The, the difference being on monetary gain versus supplying their need. See what I mean? When you have a pastor who's sitting in a mansion, raking in all kinds of dough from his congregation, that's immoral. That money should go to the poor. Because what did the tithes go to in the law? What did it go to? Do you remember? Went to the ministers, the Levites, but it also went to the poor and the impoverished in the community. If a pastor is taking in more than he needs, and I say this as a pastor, if a pastor is taking in more than he needs for his lifestyle, that's immoral. Our money should be dealt with wisely. And we are meant to care for others. Yes. So, anyways, um, they excuse their actions, live for themselves, they're showy, they're in it for the money, they're not in ministry, and they don't say good things. They just sit there criticizing everybody else. You can always trust that they'll have something bad to say. Um, Matthew chapter 7, verse 15, I think, really, um, really talks about this well. And as I'm saying these things, I want you to be thinking about your own life and weigh, weigh what, how you are, you know, and, 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 and the fruit of your life. And ask yourself, am I doing these things? Because we don't want to be found lacking in the presence of our King, do we? Absolutely not. You know, when when the master came back with the talents, he, was there any were there any servants that he didn't ask them about the talents? No. He asked every single one that he gave talents to, what have you done with this? God expects us to obey. He expects it. This is why we are baptized in the water after we're saved. Do you know that water baptism doesn't save us? You can go to you can, you can die without ever being water baptized, and you'll totally make it to heaven because faith in Christ, not works, save us. Why did he tell us to do it then? So we would obey him and publicly show that we are obeying him. Because God didn't want it to be, oh, it's just in my heart. It's my own private religion. That goes against everything that God told us to do. There's a whole reason why God brought Israel to Canaan. <laughs> it just doesn't make sense to go against that. Anyways, um, so Matthew chapter 7, 15 through 23. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but in inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit. But the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Well, that's kind of a big statement there. Many will say, you know, I don't think Jesus knew that this is very offensive. Many will say, <laughs> that was sarcasm, I'm just joking. Uh, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and, your, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? Did you hear what you just said? People who have done genuinely great deeds, that it didn't even matter. That is hard. Because we are taught that we have to leave a mark on this world before we die. We have to believe something of ourselves before we die. He just said that all that stuff's not even going to matter. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You who practice lawlessness. If those who love the Lord will obey the Lord, that's how it is. If you do not love the Lord, you will not obey the Lord. If somebody says that they love the Lord, but they don't obey the Lord, that person's a liar. That's a recap of everything that we just read. So, don't believe everything you hear. I feel like that should go without saying. I was taught that as a child, but oftentimes I still hear the same things over and over again. Somebody will get, something happens, so then somebody will go over there and talk to me. Why don't you go to our church anymore? Well, the pastor this, or, and they'll start gossiping about things that didn't even happen. Try and getting people on their sides. Right. Right. And then those people believe it, and then they come to me and Pastor and Chuck and say, why did you do that? And it's like, oh, why did I do what? <laughs> Hold on, pause. What, what did I supposedly do? <laughs> let's, let's calm down there for a second. I don't even, what? 
Anyways, it's just something that you need to remember. Don't believe everything you hear. People rejected the prophets of the Bible, but they accepted the false prophets of the Bible. Did you notice that? People killed Jesus. Who was killing the Jews while the Jews were killing the Christians? Nobody. The Jews didn't get killed until they rebelled against Rome, and then Rome had to come and put out the rebellion, and they tried multiple times to have a peaceful resolution to the issue. The Jews would not budge, and so they killed themselves before Rome ever took over the cities that they were hiding in. There was one stretch where they were hiding in caves for months upon months upon months, and the Romans couldn't get them out. <laughs> I just think that that's kind of funny. How it's like <laughs> you know, you got this huge army force, and they can't get. <laughs> Anyways, um, but just remember that people oftentimes believe in the false things. So then that takes us to kind of one of the last things um, I want to look at before we close out. Something we hear over and over again: you you can't judge me. Only God can. I hear this from Christians, not from people in the world. From Christians who are saying this, or, I'm sorry, people who are calling themselves Christians. You have no right to judge me. Only God can judge me. Well, no. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's just not true. We judge each other, and iron sharpens iron. See what I mean? Now, I'm not talking about being judgmental. And the Bible does definitely talk about that. For In the beginning of Romans, for instance, it says, you know, don't be judged. And Jesus even talks about this. Before you go being judge and judgy, you need to take out this log that's in your own eye. This person only has a speck in theirs. Absolutely, absolutely not being judge, judgmental. I'm, I'm totally on board with that. It's totally what the Bible says. However, on the other side of that, don't be judgmental. However, be discerning. Okay, now let me kind of build on that. Matthew, we're going to look at a series of passages. Matthew 24, 24 through 25. says this, for false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as to mislead if possible even the elect. Behold, I have told you in advance. Now why would he tell us in advance unless we were meant to be discerning and weigh what was said and done? In the book of Acts, the prophets are told about, well, not really important. The, prophet, the, the apostles are told about something and they weighed it and made a decision. We are never told to just have blind faith. Blind faith says, I have no idea what I'm talking about, but I'm choosing to believe it for no reason. Why do we believe in, 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 in the resurrection? Because they saw him rise. There was no body. Where did the body go? Well, the apostles took it. Okay, they died for that belief. People will die for what they believe in. They won't die for what they know is not true. Well, so the Romans took it. Now, why would the Romans take it? Why would they care? What? Well, the Jews took it. That's an idea. If you actually weigh all these ideas out, there's, there's no logical explanation except that the body did, in fact, resurrect. And we have eyewitness account of what happened. Why do we believe that Moses actually received the law on Mount Sinai? Because all of Israel saw it. <laughs> They all saw it happen. It's not like they were, oh, you know, we're out here following some moron. They all saw it. I mean, come on. We're believing things, and there's his, there's archaeological proof for things in the Bible. There's historical proof in the There is The Bible has never once been proven wrong. There's been times that people thought they had the Bible proven wrong. Oh, we got it this time. In the book of Daniel, there's, for instance, there's a king named Belshazzar. There, there was no king of Babylon named Belshazzar. That's false. Well, actually, there kind of was. See, the last king of Babylon, Nabonidus, he had a son who he made co-regent. And he went out to the desert to do God knows what, something to do with the moon god, I forget what. And he left his son in charge. Everyone living in Babylon knew his son as the king. Yes. Well, they didn't know that when they started opening their mouth about how untrue Daniel is. And then, well, it actually turns out Daniel was right. See, I mean... We don't believe something just cleverly devised myths. We believe something based on fact, not blind faith. Fact. Science cannot, cannot tell us why the Big Bang happened. Well, the Bible does tell us why the Big Bang happened. See, nothing doesn't create everything. That doesn't happen. 
It's impossible for nothing to create everything. Unlife doesn't make life. Life doesn't make consciousness. You've got a series of impossible things that happen that science cannot tell the answer for, but the Bible does. That's not following some cleverly devised myth. That's following the facts of the evidence. Proven facts. There has never once been any piece of the world that has ever been found that has no date. Everything that we can find has been dated. Everything that we can find has age. Proving that there was, in fact, a beginning. And if there was a beginning, there had to have been something that caused the beginning. That's facts. We believe facts, not myths. Not blind faith. John chapter 13, verse 35 says this. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. If you love me, in 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. We're seeing the same things repeated over and over again. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 2. Is it, it is actually reported that there is immorality among you. Well, Paul, you can't judge us. Remember, only God can judge us. An immorality of such a kind as does not exist even among the Gentiles. That someone has his father's wife. And let's just stop there for a second and say you. Yeah. You. You have become arrogant and have not mourned instead, so that the one who has done this deed would be removed from your midst. But Paul, nobody can judge me but God. God has already judged and we're carrying out what he told us to do. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 3-5. through five. You're, you're seeing the resounding theme. This isn't one book with one passage that is taken out of context, like the whole don't judge me, because in Matthew 7 it says don't judge. Context. Context. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 3-5 through five says this. If anyone advocates a different doctrine and does not agree with sound words, those of our Lord Jesus Christ, and with the doctrine conforming to godliness, he is conceited and understands nothing. But he has a morbid interest in, in controversial questions and disputes about words out of which are, uh, arise envy, strife, abusive language, evil suspicions, and he goes on with that. You can read it um, for yourself. First John, well, I'll read that one verse. In constant friction between men of depraved mind and deprived of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. First John, did you catch that about a means of gain? Mm -hmm. First John chapter 3, verses 4 through 10. Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness. And sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has seen him or knows him. Now, once again, I know pastors made mention of this. It... This translation, really, in English translation, isn't going to be as exact as the original language. No one who abides in him sins as a lifestyle, continually act, a continual action. Nobody continually sins. He's not saying that Christians are made perfect in this life. You will sin till you die. I'm talking about that, um, that living in it. Purposeful. Well, I've been sa what? Purposeful. Purposeful, yes. Well, I've been saved now, so I can sleep around because I'm saved. Wait, what? Pause. What? <laughs> Anyways, uh, little children, make sure no one deceives you. Make sure no one deceives you. Judge for yourselves. Let, uh, the one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous, he being God. The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for the purpose to destroy the works of the devil. No one who is born of God practices sin, because his seed abides in him. And he cannot sin, because he is born of God. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. There should be some kind of movement forward. There should be some kind of seeking after the Lord. Not perfection, but some kind of attempt to seek God and God's ways. Be discerning. Be on your guard, because there are a lot of people who say that I'm a Christian. And then you trust them with your secrets. You try to get close to them, and they it will bite you in the butt. Yeah. Well, I was trying to not be judgmental. That's good. Don't be judgmental. But don't be a fool. Yes. Don't be a fool. So in 1 Peter 5, which is the last of these long series of, of passages we're going to look at, it says, 
Be a sober spirit, be on the alert. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, he's prowling around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. He's just waiting. He's just waiting to devour somebody. He's looking around, seeing any opportunity he can. So be on your guard. Be alert. In other words, be discerning. <laughs> Judge for yourselves. Because a lot of people, even in a lot of churches that I've been to, there's been people who claim to be Christians that go in and they disrupt things. They go behind people's back and spread gossip. They get caught into immoral or unethical things. And then they try and grab power from other people. They can never be under authority themselves, but they want to be the head of everyone. Watch out for these kinds of people. They're, they're around this area, they're around every area. You just gotta be on your guard. See, and I'm gonna kinda wind down with this. This is my in conclusion, okay? Uh, we've been told that there's two polar opposites. There's one side which is combative, critical, and judgmental. They're just mean. Then there's the other people who's naive and undisciplined and they just condone everything. They're totally okay with sin. But there is a middle ground. You can be discerning without being judgmental. You can carry, as I'm talking to leaders here, you can carry out church discipline that God commanded you to do versus criticizing everyone over everything. We've got this new person in here. we got to make sure they follow our rules. That's not what they're talking about. They're talking about when someone is living in sin. Now, obviously, the mature are expected to be mature, and the new converts are expected to be babies. You gotta give grace where grace is due. But as we grow in Christ, he expects us to change our life. And what am I getting at? Well, that leads me to my conclusion. The first thing is people lie. Discern for yourself and judge rightly. That's my first in conclusion point. Remember that, okay? People lie. Judge. Discern. Not judge them. Well, yeah, just judge them. But I mean, don't be judgmental. See what I mean? Secondly, when people give you their side and make it sound real good, don't believe everything you hear. Honestly. Everybody, I mean, I'm sure Adolf Hitler could make his side sound good. But if you have the facts, <laughs> you see what I mean? So instead of going on, on some fact-finding quest so you can get involved in everybody's gossip, don't get involved in the gossip. But don't believe everything that people tell you. Goodness sakes. Um, we, we're not children anymore. We, we, need to, we need to be aware of things because our enemy... The devil, he's seeking to destroy the church. He doesn't want us to be doing things in the community. We gave shoes out to, be, to, to, to kids in, in the school. So he doesn't want us to do that. We, we have a safe environment on Halloween night for kids to have here instead of being out somewhere dangerous. Amen. Satan doesn't want us to do that. We took over the Easter egg hunt, and, and, and we had a fun time for the kids. We didn't have to throw God at them. It was just a safe, fun environment. Satan doesn't want us to do that because that's building up bridges. You know, the police came out to that, and they, they were just there. They just kind of hung out so people could see that they were there. So the kids get used to cops aren't bad guys. Exactly. We're building up commu the community. We're, we're, trying to get, we're trying to overcome the drug problem in our, in our area. We're trying to overcome the alcohol problem in our area. We're trying to make our community better. They're sick, and luckily we have a cure. It's called Jesus. It's called loving people. Loving people. That's the solution, but you can't truly love unless you know the source of love, and that's God. So discern your heart, and this I really, really, really want to emphasize. Discern your own heart that there is nothing immoral in you. As I've said these things, look at your lifestyle, look at how you, what you've said, and, and genuinely weigh yourself and say, Lord, show me where I'm lacking. Help me to obey you more. As far as those people who call themselves Christians but aren't really Christians, how do you treat them? Well, there's a, there's a few things. Don't give up on them. Don't give up on people. God never gave up on you. Don't give up on anyone else. You can give up on them when they're dead. Until then, don't give up on them. Pray for them. Love them, but keep your distance. Because bad com company corrupts good morals. Love them, but keep your distance.
okay? And be careful what you hear, believe, and say. Anybody's story sounds good. Anybody's story sounds good. If I know that Chuck's a gossip, am I gonna start talking about somebody around Chuck? No, because he's gonna have a problem with that. Be careful what you believe, what you hear, what you say. Be careful. If I could have, I was gonna say Ben, but I don't know, I think maybe he wouldn't like that. What do you think, Chuck? Do you think Ben would like that? No? Okay. Lauren, would you close us out in prayer, please?